Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. It's been a while since we've done a newsy type episodes and there's been a lot of security news in the last few weeks. So I figured we'd pick a couple of the ones that we wanted to talk about and go through them tonight. So the first one is the exchange proxy shell bugs. There were three security vulnerabilities that were discovered in the April's Pwn to Own Challenge for 2021. And they were patched in April and May. And why this is important is because CISA issued an alert that the proxy shell vulnerabilities were being exploited in the wild. So a tweet from Shodan on August 11th, which was a couple weeks ago now, but I mean, it's August, right? They were patched in April and May. That even in August, there were still more than 18% of exchange servers that Shodan could see exposed to the internet. So that's what Shodan does is it scans the internet for things that are exposed. 18% of exchange servers that were still unpatched and nearly 40% of them were vulnerable to the, to the CVE. So... On top of that, we know that there is a new ransomware gang lo- known as Lockfile that is using this proxy shell vulnerability to then get into corporate environments and then using another vulnerability called Petit Potom to then encrypt a corporation's data. So all that to say is it's really important still that if you're hosting on-prem exchange servers that you patch them, especially if you expose them to the internet. So, you know, kind of the first part of this here, and, and this just comes from a place of wanting people to be secure. If this is something that, and and I'm I'm going to assume, by the way, that to all listeners of our show, you're all patched. If you have any on-premises exchange service, they're patched. Um, but if you know organizations that just can't afford that level of attention or can't afford security-focused help or they have one IT administrator trying to do everything, this is where the cloud just makes sense. And this isn't like an upsell here or anything like that. This is just saying that from the cloud being a security benefit, when you have that round the clock monitoring and support and patching, and that's all just baked into your monthly cost, it's worth it in senses like this, in scenarios like this. So again, I'm sure our audience is fully patched, but please, if you know a friend, you know a, a family member, you know a small business that's just not able to keep up with this, and you know they're still running on premises exchange, it's time to it's time to let go. It's time to move that that workload to the cloud, just because that's just one less thing to worry about. And in all honesty, that's that's a, a very time consuming thing that's not value added to whatever your small business is trying to do. So again, not not an Office three six five sales pitch here, just a a plea to help secure your environment and and have a more secure world is if, if this is something that you can't keep up with, then essentially outsource it to somebody who can. And that's, that's really what the promise of the cloud is here. Um, so, so what's kind of interesting is obviously those patches for proxy shell have been available for some time. The petite podium story is a little interesting because Microsoft did issue patches as part of the August Patch Tuesday uh, regular release. And that patch did fix the vulnerability with unauthenticated access, where I don't need any credentials at all to exploit uh, the petite podium exploit that allows privilege escalation and all these bad things that go with it. There are other 
vulnerabilities that are kind of intrinsic in some of the technologies at play here. And this gets super deep in the weeds on like Windows encrypting file system and NTLM and NTLM relay and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. While there may be, and and I, I'm not speaking as a as an employee of Microsoft, I'm just speaking as, as somebody who's hosting a security podcast here. While there's the possibility that there might be more patches coming down the road um, on future Patch Tuesdays or whatever, there's also just some intrinsic flaws with some of these um, technologies that were created just many, many, many years ago and, and are mostly around for legacy purposes today. So Microsoft has published some guidance on how to harden these environments and how to mitigate against some of these vulnerabilities. And they may require some configuration changes in your, in your environment, like potentially disabling NTLM entirely. So we'll put that link in the show notes for your review. If you hear things like the August patch of Petit Potem is incomplete, that's that's not really true. Um, it, it did what it was supposed to do, which was patch the unauthenticated exploit, which is obviously the worst one. Um, but if attackers are able to obtain valid credentials, then there are some other pathways they may have. Um, to exploit this. So ultimately uh, read that guidance and follow some of those mitigation steps to harden your environment along the way. And and that would be a, a good thing to do sooner as opposed to later, because as Andy was mentioning in the, in the news here, um, this lock file ransomware gang is, is out on the prowl and, you know, they're using proxy shell to, to be kind of their initial access and then they're using this petite podium as more of privilege escalation and gaining domain dominance. So those are kind of two different parts to it. If you can keep them out the front door, then they can't come in and do the second thing. But that doesn't mean it, you know, as, as part of doing your due diligence, you, you should review this guidance and, and these advisories and implement what you can for sure. And this is why I don't think that every single zero day and vulnerability is like the sky is falling, mm -hmm. right? This is a simple thing. You should have been patched back in April and May to prevent the proxy shell vulnerability from even happening. And then they wouldn't even have an in into your environment. We, we patched the unauthenticated access, but if they happen to get valid credentials and you haven't patched the proxy shell, I mean, those are a series of events that have to happen that, you know, could have been fixed along the way. So do the basics patch and then risk mitigation if for some reason you think authenticated vulnerability in this particular sense you know there are guidance like adam said that we're going to put into the show notes and and you can review that and see what your risk appetite is on having to change some of your configuration to harden it up but again this sort of stuff i think as security professionals you know it's not this the sky is not falling and just take it one step at a time close the front door first you know, that, that brings up a really good point, Andy. And this is where I think every security professional in the world needs to go back and revisit like your high school, or maybe it was like your, your first year of college, a uh, mathematics course on probabilities, because human beings are really bad. <laughs> hey, the pandemic kind of taught us this. People are really bad at assessing probabilities at understanding risk at understanding those sorts of things. And even as security professionals, sometimes we get so focused on things like tools and zero days and black hat and blue hat. And we don't get down to the basics of what is the actual chance of a, of a attack here and what are the risks involved? And so probability for, for those of you who don't remember this from your, your mathematics course, when you are calculating multiple things that all have to happen in order for an attacker to do a thing, you multiply those probabilities together. So as an example, if I multiply a 10% risk times another 10% risk, that's like multiplying 0.1 by 0.1, you start to get into very low risk events very rapidly when you do that math. And if I add a third one to it and it's another 10%, now it's times 0.1 again, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but I know that's some very, very, very small, you know, chance of happening. It's either like one in a hundred thousand or one in a million or something like that, where I have to chain together a 10% event and another 10% event and another 10% event. The, the chances of that happening become really, really small. And so that to your point, Andy is why the sky is not always falling 
because you have to have multiple cascading failures to get to that state. And it's not to say it can't happen because people are getting their files encrypted. So it can and does happen, but just to have an awareness of, of how we evaluate the probability of one of these happening is it, it becomes very small, very quickly when I have to chain multiple things together. Speaking of probability, it kind of leads into the next story that I wanted to talk about because I found this one to be also very interesting. And again, got a lot of media coverage, got a lot of Twitter traffic, but I don't think it's one of those things that is the sky is falling, right? Mm -hmm. So you pro you may or may not have heard there was a reported vulnerability with Razer peripherals, like a Razer mouse, which is a manufacturer of gaming peripherals that are very popular. And I, I have a few of uh, Razer mice and keyboards. And the vulnerability was if you plug it in, you can escalate a non-privileged user to a an admin or even a, as a system account, which is the highest level privileges that's possible. And... First and foremost, this involves plugging a peripheral into the device, which means you have to have physical access to the device itself. So that's that's your first indication that, again, not that the sky is falling, but yes, if you have access to the device, you plug in a mouse, then you have to allow the internet to download those drivers and as those drivers are downloading, it allows you to pick the folder to install those drivers into. So it has that little browse to a folder. If you don't pick the default folder that it's going to download into, so you hit the browse button, it brings up a file explorer. Now the vulnerability is, is as those drivers are getting pulled in, it automatically pulls them in as the system account and starts to install it as the system account. And that's by default. It's also something that is a good user experience. I mean, that's it's really to, to allow you to have plug and play. So it's convenience by design. But one of the things that they didn't realize is as they're, they didn't really scope the permissions around what that system account can do when it's installing those drivers. And so when you bring up that file explorer, if you want to browse to another folder, you can shift click and bring up the menu within that file explorer and you can launch a PowerShell as system. So that is really bad, obviously. But again, needs physical access to the device. And it was really interesting, the security researcher who disclosed this responsibly to Razer got ignored by Razer. He tried to do it. He tried to do the right thing and they ignored him. So then he kind of tweeted it out to the world. And then that's where it really picked up the media coverage. And now Razor's responding. And of course, if you think through this design flaw, you're like, well, Razor can't be the only one out there to have missed this particular vulnerability design flaw, essentially. And of course they weren't. So Shortly after that, it was discovered that Steel K, uh, Steel Series, which is another popular peripheral manufacturer for gaming devices, also had that same vulnerability. And in fact, they were able to use an Android device emulator to emulate a Steel Series keyboard by plugging it in. They didn't even need an actual Steel Series device; they could just emulate the peripheral, and and that would work. So. Needless to say, the manufacturers are fixing the bugs. Again, Microsoft is aware of it as well, and they're they're investigating it on their end. But it's not something. I think it's it was just a lot of uh, a lot of hype over something that, again, it's low probability. You have to have a a physical access to the device, and I don't think there was any evidence that this was being exploited in the wild. So kind of my first question here is, and, and I don't know from an ethical standard what the exact rules are, but how hard do you have to try to do responsible disclosure before you can go public with it? Because, I mean, if he like sent something off to, and, and maybe this is 
written out. I haven't seen it just like, Oh, you know, here's our like public inquiries email address that, you know, like gets answered once a week or something. And if he sent an email and they didn't respond in 24 hours and said, well, they're not responding. I'm going to, you know, publicly disclose it. Like I wonder, and I'm just talking out loud here. I don't know what the, the ethics are around that, or if there is an agreed upon ethical time frame, like, or, or how much effort you need to invest to get somebody to respond. I'd be willing to bet that these companies like Razor and Steel Series, they probably don't have very mature bug disclosure, security disclosure programs like a Microsoft or an Apple or a Google does, where they're really, really, you know, very responsive and and definitely pay out a tremendous amount of money for them. Um, so, so that's that's interesting to me. First off, because I'm always skeptical of like. Well, how hard did you try before you just gave the public a a known vulnerability that's unpatched? Did did you see anything on that, Andy? I didn't see the time frame, and honestly, I'm not sure what the guidance is for most of them. I believe it's at least a few weeks, but that's a good question. I I don't know what the ethical answer to that would be, and how much time he actually gave Razor. Yeah. So, so that's the one thing that stood out to me when I read this. And then kind of the other part of it too, was just, and this is just kind of more of a philosophical discussion here because Andy, I think you made the point really well that this requires an authenticated user to be signed in. So like the machine can't be, you know, locked and they have to plug something in and you have to allow this, this process to proceed. And so this, this becomes again, one of those things that's almost, endemic to how windows works. One of the beautiful things about the windows operating system is the massive ecosystem around it and the amount of software and hardware that works with it. And that's always been windows strength, but in sometimes it's been windows Achilles heel for things like this as well. And I'll, I'll give an example over on the Apple side of the world in Mac OS for the longest time, there's been this concept of a kernel extension that allows you to add new capability to the Mac OS platform and kernel extensions have always kind of been this thing. If you should avoid installing kernel extensions, you should use them as, as sparingly as possible, but lots of hardware vendors will ship like a kernel extension to make their thing work like a scanner or whatever. And Apple has recently in their last couple of releases moved to a new model called a system extension which is similar to a kernel extension, but is much more hardened and there's much less it can do. So antivirus vendors like Microsoft who makes Defender for Endpoint has had to migrate from kernel extension model to the system extension model. And of course, people kind of have this awareness that Apple doesn't mess around. Apple deprecates stuff quickly. Like if you're not on board, stuff breaks. And Apple users are even very willing and accepting of the fact that Hey, just because something worked a couple of you know OS versions ago, don't expect it to work on the current one unless you know that vendor is very responsible and, and methodical with staying up to date. Uh, hardware you used on a Mac a couple of years ago may not work today because they haven't caught stayed up with all the OS changes. But on the Windows side of the world where you have literally probably millions of millions of different device drivers, if Microsoft were to make an effort to significantly restrict the level of access that device drivers have, it would break a ton of stuff. It would kind of defeat the promise of the platform. And it is very, very hard to steer all of those millions of vendors in different directions. And so that's where I think sometimes we need to be accepting of these as limitations of the operating system that come with the great benefits of it, with the great benefit of the platform, which is the diversity of choice and the diversity of options for it. Something that comes along for the ride with that is it is very difficult to make meaningful changes to the security posture of things like device drivers on windows, which is why whenever we do examples of like security tools in action, you always give the example of a malicious driver, a, a broken driver. Drivers are such a vector for malware, and it's something we need to be really um, aware of and, and conscientious of as, as we do these sorts of things. So, you know, I'm not excusing Razor or Steel Series. I mean, come on, guys, do better, you know, write, write better code. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things where there needs to be a little risk acceptance here because this is this is a little bit of you know the nature of windows and and I sound like a Microsoft apologist here and i'm I'm not 
um, despite the fact that they, they pay my paychecks, I just think there, there's certain things that you just have to be aware of the reality of the world, right? Whereas if, if Microsoft were to do something like, let's say in Windows 11 to like significantly harden how drivers work, people wouldn't do Windows 11. You know, you'd have businesses that would stay on Windows 10 forever and would demand, you know, extended security updates. And you would have people who won't update because it breaks their 10 year old HP printer and on and on and on and on. It, it just, it, it's not tenable with that platform and with the ecosystem built up around it. And so it's, uh, th this is where having really good monitoring, really good logging, really good auditing all matters. Um, and so you have visibility to these sorts of things that are happening in your environment. As you were talking about that in my head, I was thinking, you know, we do that type of analysis all the time with all sorts of things. I'll use Google as an example. If I told you you had to pay for your Gmail, you probably wouldn't stop using Gmail. If I told you that, you know, Google sells all your information, but they give you Gmail for free and you can use all these services for free, you're like, okay, well, I like Gmail. I'm going to continue to use it. Just like we kind of like being able to plug in a mouse and having it work. Mm -hmm. And so that's just kind of acceptance of the way and the design that we wanted it to be. But, you know, there were some misses in just the way it was implemented. And again, this has been around for a long time. Probably nobody was aware of it. Now that they're aware of it, they're going to fix it. So, you know, I don't think, again, this is something that we should be screaming our, with our heads on fire. And I, and I do like to, to, to point out that, and Andy, we had this discussion a bit before we went on the air. When we get down to it, to any sort of vulnerability like this, and it starts with the code had a vulnerability in it, or it had an issue with it. Obviously we would like all of our vendors to write completely hardened, secure, bug-free code all of the time, but that is not reality and will likely never be reality. So just something to point out too is evaluate software vendors, not so much based on how much bug free and, and hardened code they write. Although of course they should write as much as possible, but also in terms of how they respond to that, do they have a good security vulnerability disclosure program? Are they really professional and diligent about it? Do they respond quickly and timely? Do they pay security bounties? Are they good members of the security researcher community? Because it looks like, at least in Razor's case, there's an opportunity for improvement. Not so much to be mad that they wrote insecure code, although, you know, obviously we'd like them to do better. But I think the bigger opportunity where I'd rather see them invest first is this illustrates the need for them to have a modern vulnerability disclosure program and, and really get that figured out first. That might even be more important than getting their code to be more secure. Although those are both goals and they should skate towards both of them in tandem. I think ultimately because nobody's ever going to write 100% secure code, 100% of the time they need to have that disclosure program and need to have that very operational and functional. And I think that's more important as the first step than it is, you know, worrying about hardening all your code. Although of course, fix this vulnerability right away. So the final one that I wanted to talk about is the T-Mobile breach. And this is mainly because it, it affects me as well. I'm a T-Mobile customer. And so I got a text, you know, this was disclosed in the news. It went from 40 some million users and then they found another, you know, six, seven million users. And all of a sudden, you know, we're at 54 million customers of T-Mobile that have had their information, you know, stolen or, or breached as part of this whole uh, data breach. And so it was just for me, as I'm thinking through this, I'm a customer of them. And it's like yet another breach. And this isn't T-Mobile's first one, but I think it's for sure their worst one. And they really weren't even aware that they were breached until the information was getting sold on the dark net. But, you know, it really started to hit me as a customer when I got this message. And I'll, I'll read it to our listeners here. 
It says T-Mobile has determined that unauthorized access to some of your information or others on your account has occurred, like name, address, phone number, date of birth. Okay. Importantly, we have no inf- information that indicates your social security number, personal finance, payment information, credit card, debit card information, account numbers, or account passwords were accessed. So they have no information on that, which really means they have no idea if that stuff has been accessed. And according to their data breach disclosures, this some of this information for some customers has been accessed. Whether or not it's being abused, we don't know, but date of birth, uh, social security numbers, credit card payment, IMEI numbers, so they can clone those IMEI numbers and, and have that, your cell phone number, all of that. And so as I got this message to myself, I was thinking, what can I do to protect myself? So I started looking at guidance. And the first thing they said, you should change your account PIN. And so I went on to my T-Mobile account. I changed my account PIN. That was pretty easy to do. But I can't change my date of birth. I can't change my social security number. I mean, these are, you know, it's not like it's a password or an email address that gets compromised or a PIN. This is information that is innate to me, right? And so I, I was listening to another podcast, another security podcast, and they mentioned that one of the things you can do is to lock your credit. And that was interesting to me because I'm at the age where I already have a credit line. I don't need to get another credit card. I don't need to buy a new car. I don't need a mortgage. So I'm not like a newlywed. I'm not worrying about establishing a line of credit. And so locking your credit was appealing to me. I thought that I don't need to check my credit all the time. So I started diving down into how to do this because the other security podcast said super easy to do. Just go on to the three credit bureaus and go ahead and lock your credit. Well, Equifax has a lock and alert app. So that was kind of neat where you can actually lock your credit via the app. Well, first, when I tried to register for the app, guess what? It's an 8 to 20 character password. Why would a credit bureau, one that has been breached, put an upper limit on the password? I mean, come on now. 20 characters? Like my default's like 35. So, I mean, we use password vaults, 35 characters default, right? So, no, 20 character password. And then they ask you all those like weird questions like, you opened a loan in 2018 with what? bank or you used to live on this street you know and it was just sometimes i don't even know the answers or i can't remember the answers to those personal questions and so they said that i couldn't verify my identity so then i had to call them and i got hung up on once i tried again the second time and then i just gave up on that one i tried to lock my credit via the web in experian which you should be able to do they have a whole thing where you can Lock your credit there. And I put in my information and said, we we can't do this. Please mail in this documentation. So by snail mail, please copy it and mail it into this address, this PO box. I didn't even get to TransUnion. So I just I just kind of gave up um, on on the whole thing. And I get oh, there was also like there's a credit freeze, which is different than a credit lock. And so actually what I was trying to do was to freeze my credit. And then if you wanted to lock your credit, you have to pay a monthly fee. And that's like $25 per month with each credit bureau. So it's like $75 if you wanted to do it per month to lock your credit. And then of course, you know, monitor and all of that stuff. So I just, I just gave up on the whole thing. I already have credit monitoring because my information was breached with the federal government in the Office of Personnel Management, the OPM breach, probably in, I think it was like 2012 or something like that. So I have credit monitoring already that's provided to me. If you are a T-Mobile customer, they are providing credit monitoring for two years with McAfee. And so you can sign up for that. But, you know, my point is, is that credit monitoring only goes so far, right? Right. Because they already have all of my information. 
And the problem with credit is that the way our society works is if you already have all my information to say that you're me and then you open up credit, well, then it's on me to prove that it wasn't me <laughs> that opened up the credit, right? Like, so it's it, it's a ton of work if your identity gets stolen. The monitoring only goes so far because it only alerts you when something happens. And if it already happens, you have to go through the work to try to prove that it wasn't you. So needless to say, I was extremely discouraged and, you know, really just kind of frustrated at the state of cybersecurity and just all these breaches and feeling helpless as a consumer. So I'm a T-Mobile customer as well. And I've noticed there's been this trend with T-Mobile where, you know, they were the upstart and, and John Ledger, you know, getting on stage, literally using curse words to describe AT&T and Verizon. I mean, it, it became more than just a, a cell phone company. It became a cause, you know, to, to fight for the uncarrier and fight against dumb and dumber. And these guys who rip you off and take all your money and, you know, do horrible things to you and, and really rally people to the cause. And certainly I, I will say as a T-Mobile customer, it almost feels like you're in on something because they have the most phenomenal customer service in the industry. It's insane. I set up my account through Twitter DMs because they're that accessible. However, you want to engage with them. You call them up. You don't even go on hold. Like you just dial the number and a person answers. Like it's incredible. And they're super friendly. All their people love working there. They're great. And I mean, their plans are just absurdly cheap. There's no fees. There's no gotchas. There's no baloney. You get Wi-Fi on airplanes. You can roam in Canada and Mexico for free. You can roam in 180 countries and get like low speed 2G data for free. Like it, it feels like literally you're smarter than everybody else. If you're on T-Mobile, because you have figured out, like you don't have to get ripped off by AT&T and Verizon, and you don't have to put up with this crap and this terrible customer service. And you don't have to pay, you know, a third of your bill and fees every month. So like there's been this thing of rallying people to the cause and team magenta and they believe it. And I feel the same way. And every time T-Mobile has ever done anything that was even like slightly kind of sketchy, you know, it, it, they're they're kind of like a, a a Tesla light in that sense where, you know, Tesla, like you can't say a bad thing about Elon or Tesla and the fanboys will be all over you. Um, T-Mobile has kind of felt like that. And, and I've been on the, the, the good side of that. Like I, I believe in the cause too. Um, and I think that's almost what makes it hurt more in a, in a weird way for a lot of people in the tech community, they have, they have bought into this vision and they have bought into kind of what T-Mobile is selling as not just a service provider, but as almost an, an alternative, um, you know, the uncarrier. And, and so this one hurt more for some reason, and it's hard to explain why it doesn't completely make sense, but it just kind of does. Cause like, these were the kind of guys that that's something like AT&T has happened to them. You know, they're the ones that get breached and then send you some crappy text message. That's really vague. And then sign you up for some poopy credit monitoring and say, sorry. And, and it's like, that that's not supposed to happen to T-Mobile. You know, I think that's what makes this one hurt worse. And then yes, to the same point of, these cell phone companies capture a lot of data about you because, you know, they, they actually evaluate your credit worthiness to, you know, have you pay your bill afterwards and to loan you phones or, or sorry, to give you a loan towards a phone that you pay off with them at no interest and all the things they do nowadays. I mean, they've become lenders and so it, it just, it, it does. It almost feels helpless in that sense. I, I totally get that. And, um, I mean, I'm not going to stop being a T-Mobile customer because they're still awesome, but gosh, this one hurts. And it does kind of d diminish the view of them a little bit because, again, this is something that's supposed to happen in Dumb and Dumber, you know, not not Team Magenta, <laughs> I guess. And so that's just – this has been a weird one to deal with. And and hearing about your your trials and tribulations of doing a, a you know credit lock or credit freeze, I mean, it's just so typical just capitalist America in some ways where – we have these private, you know, credit bureaus that are kind of unresponsive and and unassailable in terms of their place in in the 
the lending industry here in this country. And there's not a darn thing you can do about it, but deal with them. They're like a bureaucracy that also makes money. <laughs> and it's just so frustrating. I, I hear you completely. And I'm not adding a whole lot to the conversation other than just commiserating with you that, gosh, this sucks. Um, so I think your, your, your plans are good there. Uh, change your pen, obviously, because we've talked about the fears of SIM swapping and using that as a 2FA compromise in the past and, and do what you can, you know, monitor your credit and keep an eye on it and uh, hope you don't have to go through that process of proving that wasn't you who, who signed up for that line of credit um, and, and look into some of these freeze and lock options. If you can, I, I know I have been uh, working on those as well. And, and I agree with, your entire assessment on it. So gosh. Um, and, and I, I think I've made the point in the show a couple of times too, that as people get more and more burnout from this and it's just become such a, you know, a fact of life anymore, I think, and I, my fear too, is that there's going to become disincentives for companies to invest in cybersecurity spend. And that for our listeners is ultimately the most scary part. When, you know, a couple of years ago, every chief executive was terrified of the hit to their stock and the, the loss of revenue and the loss of reputation and the reputational damage that a cyber incident would cause them. And today I, I feel like it's becoming like, yeah, who cares? You know, we'll send them a form letter, apologize, buy some credit monitoring, go on with life. Like nobody cares. And that is scary thought if it becomes like not a big deal and hopefully in a perverse sense, ransomware is still going to scare them enough to keep investing because the reputational damage alone, I feel like is becoming less of a concern today with, with kind of the, uh, how numb we've become to these. I don't know if it was the case with this one, but you know, there's even been reports that there are ransomware gangs or cyber criminals that are recruiting and trying to pay internal people a lot of money to provide ins, you know, because if I paid you a bunch of money and I said, hey, give me all the secrets that you know from Microsoft and you had access to that, you know, maybe Microsoft's not paying you enough or something like that, <laughs> right? Which is, you know, I mean, if it was at a company that wasn't paying you enough and, and the right person approached at the right time. So I hope it's not like some sort of inside job because that would be terrible as well. And, and there are reports that that is happening throughout you know, corporate America. And then the other thought that I had was, you know, we had Rachel O'Shea on our show about compliance. And we talked about how, if you don't have this information, then there's nothing to breach. And my thought was, why are they keeping this information? Because once you do a credit check and your credit check is good at that particular time and you're paying your bill, why do you need to keep that information around? Why even store it at all? So that was my other thought is, why are they storing this information? And, you know, that that's another lesson learned as far as companies can go is that if you don't need it, get rid of it because then there's nothing to compromise if you don't even have the information, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I would be willing to bet T-Mobile's answer for why they retain like social security numbers is that if you don't pay your bill, then they can send you to a, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name, the people that try to make you pay. <laughs> uh, and, and that sort of thing. That's probably what it is for is like referrals to a loan shark. Yeah. That's not really the, that yes, that, um, I I'd be willing to bet that's their argument. Obviously for like credit card companies, they, they continuously re reevaluate your credit worthiness to like extend you an additional credit line or whatever. Um, if you've ever gotten a like, debt collector, a debt collector. Yes. That's, that's what I was actually looking for. But you know, I, I agree. Like in general, this is where the biggest takeaway for our listeners should be that, and it's not information security's job, but make sure you are working with the right stakeholders to have those conversations around having a retention policy and making it as short as possible and getting rid of things you don't need to keep. And there's a lot of pack rat mentality out there. I, I know, um, I'll just share a brief anecdote here. I worked at a company that had Lotus notes and was migrating to exchange online. And we had to get their mailboxes under a certain threshold to make it manageable to migrate them to the cloud. 
And so I had this gentleman who had like a 110 gig Lotus notes database. And I think we wanted to get it under 25 gig to migrate it to the cloud. And it was a huge hassle because he didn't want to let go of anything. And we were looking at archive mailboxes and this and that. Well, as it has turned, as it turned out, um, litigation came in and that gentleman was named as one of the custodians in the litigation. And because he had kept every email since like the beginning of time, um, opposing counsel was able to do discovery and discover quite a lot of information that maybe would have been better not being read in or seen in open court. And he became a believer very quickly in retention policies after that. Yep. And that's the danger. What you keep is discoverable if you ever are sued or, you know, have to go to litigation. So, or in a breach, you know, both, both are bad. So, well, this was a fun episode, a newsy episode. Uh, We haven't had one of these in a while and there was a lot to talk through, but I think we had some good takeaways for our listeners. Mm -hmm. That's our show for this week. Our information will be in the show notes if you guys want to reach out to us, have questions, or have security topics that you want us to talk about. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.